Okay, we've hit 200 participants, so I think I'll start. So welcome to today's W program discussion on the feminist city. As Edwin Atley said on Twitter, it's the only city we need. I'm Manon Mollard, I'm editor of the Architectural Review, and I will just be doing a short introduction before handing over to our speakers. The W program is organized in partnership with both the Architectural Review and the Architects Journal. It promotes equality and diversity in architectural practice through a series of networking and social events, mentoring sessions, survey workshops, inspiring lectures and thought provoking panel discussions to encourage best practice and inspire change as a united voice. The programme is supported by our practice partners, BDP, Buckley Gray Yeoman, David Chipperfield Architects, Foster and Partners, Grimshaw, MICA Architects, White Architects, and Zaha Hadid Architects. We want to thank them, they enable us to organise these events. And of course, if you'd like to join the W programme or find out more about it, you can visit our website and get in touch with us. Today is one of our public events and we have invited writer and urban feminist geographer Leslie Kern and we're delighted to have so many of you here with us. Inequality is built into the fabric of cities. Urban spaces are sites of asymmetric power relations, the materialization of intersectional and deep-rooted marginalization. Since the outbreak of a global pandemic this year, these inequalities have been painfully exposed. It has become clear to many that our cities are not conducive to the labor of care. Discussing an inclusionary feminist urban vision that can teach us how to create more equitable cities, better equipped to address the multiple crises cities face, including, most pressingly, COVID-19, is the aim and challenge of today, of this session. So Leslie will open with a um, lecture based on her latest book, Feminist City, which was published this summer by Verso, and where she lays out an intersectional feminist approach to the city. We will then hear responses and comments from Victoria Cooper, who's associate at Buckley Gray Yeoman, and from Lily Zarziki, who is assistant editor at the Architectural Review. These initial responses will form the basis of the conversation that will follow. It will be a conversation chaired by Lily, and we will of course be taking your questions in. Some of you have already sent your questions through to us between yesterday and this morning but you're of course also able to submit them in the Q&A section, which is shown in the bar at the bottom of your Zoom window. We have until 2 p.m. London time, so we'll try and get as many of them discussed and answered as possible. Thanks very much again for joining us, and without further ado, I will now hand over to Leslie Kern for her lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Manon, for that introduction, and thank you to everyone who's joining us today. It's a real honor to be invited to participate in this conversation with you. This book, Feminist City, it, uh, the Canadian edition came out about a year ago, and since then the world has absolutely changed in really dramatic ways. But as Manon said, it's been fascinating to be able to have these conversations in the time of this pandemic because suddenly many of the things that I was gesturing to in the book uh, have become a very much an embodied reality for many people's daily lives and it's offered a chance to really expand some of these conversations about care, about justice, about sustainability, and about uh, how we can start to reimagine our cities with equity kind of at the forefront or at the very foundational building blocks of, of everything that we put together. So I'll just start my presentation here. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm, I'm coming to you today from what is currently known as Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada, but it sits on the unceded Indigenous territories of the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people, with whom we are governed by the treaties of peace and friendship on this land. The title of my talk today will be The Feminist City, Stumbling Blocks and Building Blocks. So thinking about some of the things that are barriers to a vision of the feminist city and some of the things uh, that we can start to imagine as the groundwork, the new groundwork for, for moving forward. As I mentioned, the book came out about a year ago and my vision in writing this was to bring some of the insights of feminist urban scholarship to a wider audience, not just to be speaking to my fellow academics or even to my students, although the conversations that I've had with students over the years were part of what inspired me to try to take this conversation to a wider stage. The book 
uses a kind of an embodied experiential lens. So starting from my own personal experiences, not suggesting that they're universal, but as a, an entry point, a way of asking certain kinds of questions about the city that might not typically get asked in the halls of city planning offices, budget offices, and, and design expertise. One of my goals was to start to sort of denaturalize the built environment. It can seem just like the water we swim in, something that we take for granted that we don't necessarily think of as having social origins. And certainly many people would not really think about the built environment as being an active participant in shaping social relations, including inequalities. The built environment might seem like sort of a stage where these things are acted out, but from a, a geographer's perspective, and I imagine from an architect's perspective as well, there's an understanding that the, the form of the environment around us is also an active participant. It's also shaping the way that we uh, experience life in the city, the way that we relate to one another, all sorts of different things. So my goal was to have, you know, your, your everyday average person be able to look around the city and to say, oh, I wonder how this got to be this way. What sets of values and norms went into creating this particular neighborhood or this kind of building or this park. And as Manon mentioned, I, I aim to take an intersectional approach, which means that I'm not just interested in thinking about, well, we've had a sort of male vision of the city, so what's the female vision of the city and just sort of doing a gender swap there. It's more about trying to understand the ways that different sets of power relations, including those around gender, but also race, class, colonialism, sexuality, ability, age, and other factors that come together to both inform people's experience of city life, but also to create this kind of matrix of power relations that is shaping everything from, you know, what decisions get made, where money, is spent, who makes money in the city, and essentially, yeah, just, just how power operates in, in urban spaces. So <clears throat> those are some of the, the central aims of the book. And the book is, is not really a, I would say, a blueprint for a, a feminist city, but perhaps introduces a set of values around which we might shape our cities and our relationships. I'll leave the actual blueprint drawing to the experts like you <laughs> as, as architects. So my objective today is to encourage us to consider equity, inclusivity, care, and justice as primary objectives rather than afterthoughts in the city. And for accessibility, I'm going to note what uh, most of the images are in my talk. So in this image we have um, a drag queen in thigh-high red pleather boots crossing a, a rainbow crosswalk in Toronto's Church Street neighborhood and uh, although this was taken before this happened I'll just note that this particular drag queen Priyanka was the winner of Canada's uh, drag race the the Canadian version of RuPaul's uh, competition so just a little <laughs> side tidbit there for you. All right, so the COVID crisis. As Manon mentioned, this crisis has laid bare a lot of the longstanding problems and inequalities related to planning and design in our cities. So a few of the ones that I'll just highlight here because I, I think this could be an incredibly long list and therefore an incredibly long talk. For our purposes today, I'll highlight the form and function of the home. So as we have been um, encouraged to confine ourselves to our home and to limit our contacts to the sort of nuclear family, this has raised a lot of questions about how our homes can possibly function or serve to meet all of the needs that we're asking them to meet in this particular moment. It's also a, a moment where some of the things that the single family home has effectively kept hidden are being raised into view. So domestic violence would be one of those issues that is um, increasing in prevalence, but also has been in some ways made visible, not the violence itself, but the issue has been, been raised up. Obviously, the single family home is also quite effective at keeping hidden all of the unpaid, invisible, unacknowledged care labor that keeps society running in all times, not just times of crisis. 
And the little headline that I have here from, from uh, a couple of months ago in Canada, her kid had a stuffy nose. Um, she's one of many Ontario families in COVID testing limbo. And this refers to when kids went back to school, if they had a runny nose, uh, parents immediately had to pull them out of school and then stay home from work themselves. But these headlines were invari invariably accompanied by pictures of women who were the ones who were taking the kids out of school and expected to stay home with them. So it's just one of those examples of the sort of gendered impacts of COVID and, and the way that the family is presumed to function. And then moving from the home to thinking about public space, we've certainly noticed that the public spaces that we have in our cities, the shared spaces, have not really been set up to provide collective services. They haven't really been set up to say feed people, right? Or to create spaces where other kinds of care work can happen. We're kind of scrambling to figure out if this is even possible. So we found that there is a real difficulty of trying to collectivize care work because most of our public spaces, uh, well, if they haven't already been privatized, which is another uh, problem, then they just have, have been um, not really been considered as places where we could engage with one another in these ways. So what questions then can we ask ourselves? This image uh, shows the um, attempt at creating a co sort of COVID friendly public space in a park with literal bubbles drawn on the grass <laughs> so that people can uh, socially distance in their little uh, pods. So this is one of the interventions that we've come up with in public space. But some of the questions that I think we have to ask right now is, you know, are our cities, homes and buildings built to carry us through crisis and not just the pandemic, but of course, all of the other crises that are either with us or looming, including financial crises and of course, the, the climate crisis. Who and what are we relying on? And by this, I mean, what kinds of labor are we drawing on, both unpaid and underpaid labor? And whose work is this? Who is doing this work in our society? And is, is this a sustainable model? What assumptions underpin these systems? So what assumptions about who does particular kinds of labor? Where does this labor happen? How do we value this labor? Uh, those are just some of the questions that we can start to ask. And of course, we always have to consider the values that are informing our designs. Nobody is a completely sort of neutral, objective, um, uh, intervener in these systems, we all bring with us our own sets of norms and values that are informed by our families and our, our cultures and our religions and the milieu that we grow up in, the education systems that we <clears throat> are trained within. And these inform everything from what we think is a beautiful space to what we think is an accessible space, to what we think is a fun space, right? All of these kinds of things are very much shaped by a set of values that can come to seem like common sense, but might actually reflect a fairly narrow experience, especially when we look at who tends to be the, the faces of the planning profession, the architecture profession, and so on. And so then we, we can also ask, how is design contributing to both the problems that we see and how might it contribute to the solutions? What can we come up with? So certainly this um, drawing chalk circles on, a, on park grass is, is um, one kind of intervention, but I wouldn't necessarily suggest that it's like a socially transformative intervention or perhaps even the best that we could come up with in thinking about different ways of using the public spaces that are available to us. So as a good feminist, one of the things that we always like to do is to question binaries, so kind of dualistic ways of thinking about things where we assume that uh, things are in oppositional relationships to one another. So of course, for feminism, a big binary would be the, the gender binary, and we want to both question its binary nature and to question the assumptions that uh, rest on, on kind of what has presumed to be each end of the binary. But I would suggest that even in the world of, of cities and planning and design, there's lots of kind of binary thinking that might be implicitly lurking in our minds in terms of, again, those assumptions that we draw on, those values that are shaping things. <clears throat> 
So I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I just want to throw them up here as a bit of a provocation to remind us that uh, thinking about these spaces and these relationships in a, a binary manner is perhaps part of the problem that when we come to a moment of crisis, we realize that the spaces around us and the ways that we've set up our social and economic relations, our care work and so on are, are not very flexible. And for many of us, the experience of the pandemic has already kind of collapsed some of these binaries, but in, in other cases, it might have um, widened the gap between these, these things. And I think it's a very ripe moment for questioning them. So for example, home and work, for many people, this is a binary that has now been um, quite collapsed in ways that have, again, gendered implications. But of course, for other people who don't have the luxury of working from home, um, this this uh, has posed a new set of problems where going out to work is perhaps a dangerous activity and something that you have to think about when you then come home. Uh, family and friends is another one that I, I like to think about as a, as a feminist in, in thinking about the ways that the traditional nuclear family has been set up as the building block of society. It's assumed to be the ultimate in relationships, the primary relationships that we have. But again, the pandemic is perhaps showing that the immediate family cannot be the be all and end all of our social relations. And this is one of those binaries where maybe people are feeling like these things have been pushed further apart. We've been assumed that, that we can get everything that we need from the family and that we don't need these other kinds of social relations. But I think that's um, a very narrow sighted view. And the last one that I'll, I'll mention here is maybe this division between public and private or a presumed division between public and private spaces that, um, again, does a lot of work in hiding all sorts of exploitative and, and unpaid labor. It works quite well to kind of keep the status quo functioning as it is, but as we try to envision something that looks like a feminist city, I think we have to do some work to collapse this and to say, well, some of these things that have been assumed to be uh, best served in the realm of the private might actually need to be made public in order to create a more kind of sustainable um, care system slash economy. And again, I don't, I also wouldn't separate those things, care and the economy. That's another kind of binary that we've set up that is really problematic in this, in this time period. So what then can we say about envisioning a more feminist city? And I say more because I don't know that there is a perfect utopia out there that will somehow reach, but that uh, there, there are steps that we can take and ways of changing our thinking that could um, move us in this, in this particular direction. So here are some of the principles. These would be the building blocks, if you will, moving on to kind of the second half. Here's some of the building blocks that I would encourage us to think about. So the first one I'm just calling uh, margin to center. And the images here include a person accessing a public transportation system in a wheelchair, a man pushing a stroller with a young child, and a group of elderly people walking down the street with their uh, walkers, their, their mobility devices. What I mean by margin to center is a perspective that takes the groups and the experiences that have been considered to be kind of niche or the min minority experience in the city and brings those to the center. And I would argue that when we start to do that, when we really look around at, at who lives in cities, that the group that has been kind of presumed to be the majority, the sort of able-bodied adult, the productive worker, the <clears throat> kind of easily mobile um, subject might actually be the minority, right? When we think about all the different groups who, who use cities, that that might be the niche. So I think sometimes there might be an assumption that if we design for disabled people, then we're designing for a niche group, or if we design for women, regardless of the fact that they're 50% of the population that we're also designing for some kind of special interest group. But arguably taking these groups together, this is the majority, right? And when we improve the conditions 
for one of these groups, we're likely to have this kind of trickle down effect that improves the conditions for everyone else. So I would challenge us to think that um, vulnerability in, in some way or marginality does not actually equal a, a niche. And to have a more inclusive vision of the city means bringing all of these so-called marginal niche minority groups to the center and kind of starting from their needs. Because let's face it, the um, able-bodied, heterosexual, white, male worker, he'll be fine no matter what we do. He doesn't necessarily need any further interventions aside from perhaps, um, you know, changing tables in, in um, men's washrooms <laughs> that he can engage productively in care labor as well. But yeah, okay. <clears throat> The second point that I, I want to make, and this is something that's certainly been increasingly brought to our attention by the Black Lives Matter movement uh, being reinvigorated over the summer, is that the symbolic matters. It does communicate to people who belongs, whose stories matter, whose histories are considered important and relevant. And the images that I have here, the, the one in, in the top is an image of um, Edward Cornwallis, a statue of Edward Cornwallis, sorry to be more accurate, being hoisted by a crane uh, from its position in downtown Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is just a couple of hours down the road from me. And Cornwallis was a sort of governor of this territory in colonial times, and he famously had a bounty on Mi'kmaq people, indigenous people's scalps um, to, you know, aid in the brutal suppression of, of indigenous people in this area. But of course, he still had a statue to him in downtown Halifax. There are streets named after him. But through a lot of protests, uh, the statue has now been kind of put into storage while we consider the future of Cornwallis's legacy in, in, in Halifax. I've also included an image of the very recent statue or the representation, I guess, of Mary Wollstonecraft that I saw a lot of news um, about over the last week. So this is this kind of silver um, naked statue, of course, has generated a lot of conversation about how we represent women in our public spaces. And if you just Google something like statues of women, you'll find that there are really very relatively few statues of known women. There are lots of figures of often the naked female body, but of actual real women who lived and did things in the world. All over, all over the world, there's very few of those statues. So again, it's, it's one piece of representation, but it's something that reminds us, like who is considered important in society, right? Who has power? And the final image is just uh, the Mi'kmaq flag flying over my university campus, Mount Allison campus. Now it flies next to the Canadian flag to you know, indicate this relationship between indigenous people and uh, this thing that we now call Canada, and and again, it's symbolic, but it's an important measure that says we're taking we're taking this seriously. So, my third building block here relates to the point that I was making about uh, binaries like home and work, public, private, family, friends, as being ways that kind of limit the possibilities for thinking about collectivizing care work. So I want us to be imagining ways that we can take some of the functions that have been assumed to be private and have fallen disproportionately on the shoulders of women in the home and in the community and to try to make these public in some way. And I think the pandemic is a great moment to envision this because it is a time when we are thinking, okay, we need to be outside, right? This is a safer way to be with one another. And so how can we use our outdoor spaces in new ways, in different ways that make some care work, not just public, but collectivize it or encourage a collectivization that might encourage a long-term rethinking of how we do this labor. So everything from having community kitchens where we provide meals for people and a space to socialize to having outdoor educational spaces, for children or ways that children um, can also contribute to kind of building the built environment or, or shaping the built environment. These are just a few examples that we might imagine where we can try to kind of, you know, spew out some of the stuff that has been hidden in the home and has been uh, 
deeply, I think, exploitative for a long time, put it into the public realm and share it in different ways. And of course, this is also about providing for people who uh, don't have the privilege to access these things in their own homes or who are um, inadequately housed or who are low income. So this is also a way of kind of caring more broadly for our communities. The next principle is thinking about starting from the body, you know, making the really obvious point that people have bodies, yet this seems to be a point that is often forgotten or treated as sort of an afterthought or even like a pesky design bug that people have to think about. Oh, where do I put the washrooms? This is not the fun part of design. This is not why I became an architect or a planner, right, to think about public toilets. But arguably having accessible clean, safe public toilets, having uh, restrooms that match your gender identity. These are some of the things that allow people to participate in public life. And again, the pandemic has shown that when we don't have these facilities, we run into real problems in asking people to be outdoors because you simply can't uh, socialize or conduct your, your life or, or children's education programs outdoors without washroom facilities. It's just impossible. So we all have bodies and if we imagine that universally we need spaces to rest, we need shade, shelter, water, food, and we need uh, spaces to care for our bodies or to help care for the bodies of, of other people who are in our care or who are our responsibility, what kinds of spaces would we design? What sorts of things would we prioritize when we imagine a new park, a new building? Um, if instead of seeing these as the kinds of things that we have to add in at the end, if we started from these spaces, what could we envision? So this to me is a really um, crucial piece. So the last point that I, I want to make is, again, thinking about the, the importance of care work and asking us to question who and what is public space for? So I've, I've been thinking again with the pandemic about the ways that some cities have um, tried to repurpose certain um, aspects of public space to encourage us to be outside of our homes. And one of those ways some of you have seen has been things like bubble dining, right? So, or um, expansion of restaurant spaces, cafe spaces onto the sidewalks. And this has been touted as sort of a way of like keeping the economy going, keeping people going out and spending money in safe ways. But it's also taken up sidewalk space in ways that are quite problematic for anyone with a stroller or a disability or, uh, you know, lugging their groceries in a, in a cart down the street. So that's one part of it. But it also raises these questions about who we think uh, has an entitlement to this sort of space. So the image that I've shown here is actually a pre-COVID image, but it's kind of prescient uh, as to what has kind of happened. So this is an image of, you can see there's a, an expressway, so a freeway running over top of a space where these little bubble tents have been set up for people to come and dine. But this is a space where you can imagine, as, as happens in many cities, homeless people often live under uh, freeway overpasses, but the city of Toronto, this is Toronto, my hometown, uh, cleared out homeless people from this space. This is 2019, so again, before the pandemic, and then created this like luxury, like outdoor dining experience for middle-class people to sit in these pretty twinkle light bubbles and have a meal served to them, again, in a place where, where homeless people had just been trying to survive. So there's also protesters outside of this space from the um, Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, a nonprofit group. But now, you know, fast forward a year later in, in the pandemic, and we see this happening um, on, on our very streets again, where people are proposing kinds of bubbles or even just a takeover of sidewalk spaces. But we're not really asking these questions about um, who has a right to this space and who have we decided has to be cleared out of this space at all costs and, and what is happening to those people. I think in many places we've really failed to think about the needs of homeless or precariously housed people during the pandemic. So I, I put this here to really, you know, offer this provocation that as we're thinking about things like how do we reopen the economy and keep businesses going, that if we don't have a kind of care-centered 
focus to that, we're going to end up reproducing or even exacerbating a lot of the exclusions that already are, are happening in our city. So the, the question of who is the city for remains a, a really relevant one in this, in this time. So let me wrap up to, to just uh, say that, you know, the disruptions to the fabric of daily life right now are perhaps a perfect moment for placemakers like architects, designers, planners, and so on, but also for everyday people who I think are also people who make space in the city. Uh, it's, a, it's a great moment for us to really question the things that we have taken for granted, to question the common sense that has long shaped our cities, to ask, are the things that we have considered to be good and normal and true and right, are, they the are those the principles that we want to carry forward or are there maybe some uh, either tweaks or perhaps just a total radical revisioning of all of it that we might want to think about as we envision how we're going to have our cities and the spaces that we make in them carry us through these, these times of, of crisis. So it's time to question the common sense that shapes our cities. And I will, I will wrap up there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. That was brilliant. Very thought provoking. I think you've started to address some of the questions that were sent to us um, between yesterday and this morning, but we'll, we'll continue in some, some more are being posed. Um, I will now hand over to Victoria Cooper, Associate at Buckley Gray Yeoman, who will kind of share her initial thoughts before we kind of continue the conversation. Hi, thank you very much. And thanks, Leslie. That was really interesting. Obviously, I'm speaking from a practicing architect's point of view. And actually, I have to say, it's really sort of pushed me to maybe reflect and has been uh, kind of really insightful in terms of thinking about all those normal things we do, particularly in practice, I suppose, and actually perhaps taking a bit of a step back and thinking about it in the wider context. And in a way, I suppose that sort of links to what's happened over the last few months in the world, because as, as you mentioned, I think towards the beginning of your presentation, particularly in roles of care, um, uh, looking after children or el elderly relative, relatives, it feels like this time has exposed some of those roles and the burden that that may have put on certain people more in society than others and, and perhaps I suppose being slightly optimistic I would hope that it would spur on that um, time for change and for questioning it as you, as you say which often these kind of big shifts um, in our lifestyles can hopefully hopefully do and, and perhaps there's that opportunity therefore for these to become less gender focused and more respected so there might be more of a um, sort of an equality which therefore kind of opens up hopefully more equality in both the city, public realm and uh, workplace. Um, and actually at BGY we, we design quite a lot of workspaces so often sort of I suppose on the threshold of public realm into private and that relationship is really important. What's happening outside impacts the inside. One thing we've been talking quite a lot about over the last few months is obviously working from home is what we've all been pushed to do and now we're almost beginning to look at home at work and hopefully within the next few months we will begin in some capacity to go back to offices um, and is there a kind of an opportunity there to think about roles in the home um, and their values and how that might translate into the workplace um, I don't feel like I've, I've got the answers of really quite what that might be, but whether it might be about supporting childcare or flexibility. It certainly pushed agile working, for example, in architecture. I know that's, that was always been a bit of a, ooh, not sure about that, whereas actually the last few months has, has enabled that and perhaps people to fit work around their lifestyles, regardless of their gender, in a more positive way, I hope. Um, and then finally, really, I suppose a bit of an observation and question is something that's particularly interesting in London and the UK, and I think across the world, is public space that appears public, but in reality is private. And as you say, 
um, these pop-ups of bubbles and things, which all seem very appealing and means you can go and still have your pints with your friends. Um, but how we might deal with that, and it feels like therefore the stakeholders, the decision makers, that diversity, you know, almost becomes this circular um, discussion about if the people making those, those decisions are more diverse, we hope therefore it can respond and fulfil the needs of a more diverse society. Um, yeah, they're my sort of thoughts and kind of a few questions included there, hopefully. Thanks, Victoria. I think part of the um, reason why we set up the conversation like this is exactly to have a kind of um, kind of the point of view of the geographer, the point of view of the kind of architect, Lily, who's trained as an architect, but now has the role of an editor, and to see how that conversation can kind of be productive. And if between you, we can arrive at some sort of, of questions and then an attempt at answer, answering them from those different um, perspectives. Um, I will now hand over to Lily, who will share her kind of um, comments and questions and remarks, and will then um, moderate the conversation. There's some great questions coming in, so I'll feed them through. And for the audience, if you have questions um, as the conversation unfolds, please add them to the Q&A. Uh, hi, thank you, Manon, and thank you, Leslie and Victoria, um, for your for your insight and thoughtful response. Um, I am particularly interested in um, this idea of what architects and urban designers can do here and I think that um, this 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 binary of care and economy that that you pose Leslie is um, is also a question of responsibility and of who has responsibility to provide that care um, I in your in your book you kind of touched upon uh, how the responsibility of care has um, largely been shifted from the state to the individual um, and I, that has been clearly exacerbated so deeply by um, COVID and I think that I think that it we while we shouldn't be thinking about trying to transfer everything to the individual because the state has proved uncaring or transfer everything to the state because that is their responsibility and when perhaps they won't act on that. Um, I think that we should be looking through both, but we should also look at uh, how architects can take responsibility and what they can do and how that responsibility manifests um, in terms of how they think through um, who is going to be impacted by uh, the decisions that they make and how they kind of can like take on the interests of the community um which i think um while obviously uh putting people into positions of power and positions where they make decisions who um are very diverse is obviously important i think it is also um it really highlights the need to um work in kind of participatory fashions um because I, I don't think any individual should be expected to um, be <laughs> responsible for making decisions for anyone who looks like them. Um, th that, shouldn't, that shouldn't ever be something that's expected. Um, and I also, um, that's a kind of more architectural question, um, but I also uh, was thinking about how we speak about these things and how we um, talk about this and I think that the point that you raise um, about uh, binaries is so interesting because we have in in your book especially there's kind of I've noticed a movement between um, pointing out the very basic differences in experience faced by men versus how women face those and then moving also to then a more kind of intersectional perspective and showing how that kind of basic binary division is then also marked by um, all of these different kind of intersecting vulnerabilities and um, and uh, points at like situated points. 
Um, and I was kind of um, thinking about how when, the, when we still, when we have so many different intersecting ways in which people are marginalized and we have yet to kind of hit a sort of baseline equality on any of them, how is there a way in which we can speak about these things that try to get away from relying on binaries that make sense but are also trying to encapsulate some of the kind of very varied nuance um, that kind of run along these lines and it's I'm it's not something that I expect to have an answer to because I think it's <laughs> um, I think that's a really complex question and something that like should actually just be constantly reevaluated. but it's something I would like to kind of consider um, as we move forward. Um, and I, I'm going to move on to a bit of questions from other people now as well. Um, and uh, one thing that was posed was um, how can we reimagine housing with um, uh, with this with an idea of care and infrastructures of care, but also um, reimagine it with uh, kind of getting away from a necessarily nuclear family structure um, and associated uh, division of, of roles. Uh, thank you both Victoria and, and Lily for your comments and thank you to people who are who are sending questions in for us as well. I think uh, some really yeah important issues are, are already being raised here. Um, I'll just I'll come to the housing question in a minute but I wanted to also just touch on um, Victoria's point about the kind of privatization of, of public space and to me I, I've you know, in thinking about the, the pandemic and about care and about a sense of collective responsibility and the ways in which in, in many places around the world we're seeing people really um, balk at the idea that we have a collective responsibility to one another. And this is really um, kind of symbolized in the, you know, refusal of people to wear masks, right? Like, which is a really incredibly basic way of saying like, oh, we're responsible to one another. We care for one another, right? But even that refusal, uh, and, and so from an, from an urban geographer's perspective, I, I think about the ways in which our cities um, for, for a long time now have been kind of encouraging that fear of one another, that sense of disconnection from one another. And I think privatization is one of those forces, the kind of securitization, militarization of urban space, over surveillance, and of course, over policing of particular communities in cities. So one of the, the sort of the big picture things that I'm interested in thinking about is how can design and different sorts of urban intervention kind of try to bring us back or at least maybe it's not maybe I shouldn't be nostalgic for something that maybe never existed but bring us to a place where our environments are also encouraging us to recognize our collective responsibilities to one another rather than setting up a relationship of you know, individualization, fear, those sorts of things. And I think that, you know, the built environment can't fix all of that, but it plays a part. It plays a part in, in how we imagine our relationships with people beyond our most immediate family. And maybe that segues into this sort of housing question. Um, and, and to me, one of the things we, we could think about is, again, the idea a, a maybe a mistaken idea that still lingers that the traditional nuclear family is still the dominant household form in many places. Um, in Toronto, for example, I was reading that some one third of households are single adults in the city of Toronto, which raises its own problems around the pandemic and people being asked to isolate in their household when it's just you. <laughs> you know, what happens when you're sick, when you need uh, care, when you need mental health, um, kind of like all of that kind of stuff. We're not even thinking about it, right? It's not even on the agenda really to care about single people. Um, so when we start to maybe reevaluate how are people living and what sorts of different housing options might suit different people and I think the answer is that we need a wide variety. People are still going to want to live in single family 
units? Of course they are, right? Um, that's not going to disappear overnight. But what other options can we imagine and how can we support those through things like zoning policy, through housing design, and even through uh, legislation, our rules about property ownership, for example, um, taxation, all of these things are kind of implicated in thinking about how people can live together in different ways that might involve things uh, that I think are also sustainability initiatives, like sharing some of the, um, like creating more energy efficient ways to live. The single family home is a kind of pretty inefficient way to live, I, I, I think in terms of, we've all got our washing machines, we're all cooking for just two or three people at once, like we're all, you know, sucking our own energy and putting um, wasted energy out into the environment, wasting water, like there's gotta be more efficient ways to do it. And I think climate change will probably force us to do that, but maybe we could be intentional about it instead of waiting until we literally don't have the energy or resources to live this way anymore. So. Maybe that's not a very optimistic note to end on, but I'll <laughs> I'll pause there and, and see if uh, Victoria or Lily want to jump back in. I I think that's really interesting, and uh, it, it's not it's not purely a British thing, but you know this sort of inherent class system about having your double fronted house with your drive and your nice car on it is it's sort of you know it's so we're so kind of past that time and in a way densities of cities and flexibility and having to work at home things like that hopefully should be a cause of change but one thing as well Leslie I know you talked quite a lot because you grew up in cities and love the city and then you know uh, during these times lots of people are talking about the death of the city and, and moving out and Often, I think that's associated with having more space and outdoor space. I suppose it's a bit of a question of how, how do we how do we shift that kind of square footage requirement that people are so desperate for and kind of making money and seeing housing as a commodity as a way of making money. Maybe what's happening with the economy at the moment is going to say to us actually. You know, it's not about making tens of thousands of pounds each year on this um, bricks and mortar. It's about your quality of life that that space provides and hopefully then to the sort of wider community. I um, totally agree. And I also, um, I, I feel like we've seen kind of these very rapid shifts between kind of very radical optimism and kind of very imaginative ways of, of this, saying, okay, this is, um, they a moment to completely reevaluate what seems like common sense um, and then kind of very quickly swinging back the other way as um, economic forces kind of reassert themselves or the way in which um, economic forces have asserted themselves in the past kind of being repeated rather than rethought um, and that kind of like uh, <laughs> normative kind of like uh yeah returning to like this, this desire to return to normal which i think is um very rooted in um or or something that is more prevalent for people who uh, for whom the normal previously was very comfortable um and uh one one question that's also been posed that kind of goes with this is that is do we need a feminist economics that goes alongside feminist urbanism um and i know that in that in your book you kind of talk about how um there, there's an idea from um uh some people who are kind of more economically uh minded than uh, than people who come at things from a more kind of intersectional and feminist perspective that if you work out the economic side of things that Every, every, the rest will sort itself out um, and I completely agree that that's kind of not the case that they need to be held um, together and therefore kind of what would a, what might a feminist economics look like and what um, how can these things be held together and work together yeah that is a that is a great question and Hmm, how to 
how to approach that. I, yes, I mean, I, I definitely resist a kind of economic reductionism or a, a, an analysis that always kind of comes back to, well, if you just fix, I don't know, income inequality or whatever, then everything will be fine. Um, on the other hand, of course, those things really matter, right? Um, it's, it's not that it's not about class or economics, it's that we do have to understand or at least attempt to understand the way that the current economic system, you know, capitalism, um, to, to put it bluntly, is uh, not just about class inequality, but it also relies on both gender and racial inequality to function in the way that it does. And so you, uh, can't make the assumption that simply tackling class inequality would eliminate racism or eliminate sexism. So it's kind of a, about trying to take those things together. But um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look for certain kinds of economic solutions um, or, or to recognize that some kinds of economic interventions actually can have potentially really good effects of something like a universal basic income, which again is something that has been revived in the context of a pandemic as many governments have kind of rolled out like a temporary sort of universal basic income for, for people to cope uh, with job loss and, and precarity during this time. And feminists have, have often argued for universal basic income because it's a way of actually recognizing care work, that if you are not employed in the formal economy but you are at home you're not doing nothing right you are contributing to the economy and so giving you a monthly income even a, a small monthly income is one way of actually recognizing that as labor that deserves some kind of uh, economic valuation in in society so it's a kind of a way of getting towards almost you know wages for housework or um that that economic recognition so but you know it's not the be all and end all but i do think that we um, it, that's an important measure it's also something that i think would be um uh important for domestic violence um initiatives because of course a lack of affordable housing is something that keeps uh people trapped in abusive relationships and the um economic dependence and economic uh, control that happens in domestic violence situations is is a huge piece of it. So, um, so yes, I think a feminist economics <laughs> is absolutely necessary. And there, there are ways of bringing those analyses together. Thank you. That, um, yes. <laughs> um, and I, um, I, I'm glad that you also brought up uh, wages for housework, um, and I I think that it um, talking about this um, the about economics in the city and about um, where these things kind of uh, are dependent on one another and feed into one another. It kind of um, it it shows the limits of um urban design and architecture but also the ways in which those um outer limits are kind of brush up against um so many other things and are so interdependent um and i um yeah i think i think that that uh something that uh, uh has also come through which i i think is is kind of of interest here is um about influencing kind of developers um mindsets which are obviously of kind of principle you know like their, their interests are of um are principally in economic um largely speaking um and i mean i think that personally it um i i think that developers cannot can't be um uh shouldn't or cannot or should not be asked to um uh how am i how am i going to explain this it's um i think as as private companies they're not structured in a way that has care at the heart of how they are set up and so to expect them to adequately care under the current structure is not kind of is not a workable system, but I was interested as to what you um, both might think. 
Um, yeah, so that's a really interesting point because I think it's very easy to um, kind of put the blame on developers and go, they're just they're money grabbers and they're not giving anything back to society. And there might be some truth in that, but like you say, with the current structure, their their aims and their business models, you know, aren't about you know pouring money, rightly or wrongly, into public realm. Um, I think, and this probably will go back to Leslie as well as the question. There are some interesting points I think about stakeholders, decision makers. I think as architects, we need to be pushing the agenda in terms of value through design. So actually, not just looking at buildings within your boundary in in a space, and that's the only way to to get a really good product at the end of it. And actually looking kind of to the further context, how people approach, how people move around the space, you know, whether it's pedestrianising spaces, making them safer, perhaps it's going to be a more appealing building, whatever that building might be. So it's, it's probably a short sighted to just kind of, you know, close, close the door and only look internally. So I do think there's a role for architects to play in that in terms of our relationship in working with developers and through the, the planning process. And I think as well, you know, something that's becoming better known is, you know, things like public practice, which is about trying to get architects back into council um, projects, firstly within London and now they're kind of spreading wider across this country to then inform the planning process, the policy decisions, which ultimately impacts how planning decisions are made. And, you know, maybe there need to be some incentives about how developers might invest money. Um, sort of in, in the wider context, thinking about the overall city as opposed to individual buildings. Um, and Leslie, the reason I'm sort of nodded to you again was because I know, I know a little bit about it. You've talked about the Vienna project and the approach there in terms of decision making leading to kind of a different approach, maybe a more considered approach to public space, which might be a useful point to talk about. Yeah, thank you. And this um, also relates to Lily's earlier point when she was speaking about kind of participatory planning or design and um, <clears throat> the, the ways in which I think many communities feel uh, quite disconnected from the planning and design processes that are going on around them. Um, often, at least in the North American context, the sort of duty to consult with communities is seen as like just a hurdle that developers or, or planners have to get over. And so, you know, a little paper notice goes up that says meeting tonight, 730, uh, you know, oh, nobody came. I guess the community didn't care, right? So people kind of give up on the process and don't want to be involved because they don't really feel like they'll be listened to. And of course, the more marginalized you are in that community, the less likely you, you are to have ever you know, to, to go to a meeting or to have your voice heard. So thinking about, um, you know, everyone who's kind of involved in different ways in these design processes as, as having a, a kind of a, a ground up approach and that, you know, the, the Vienna example um, is, is one where, you know, they kind of started out by surveying people, right? Like, you know, trying to listen to people to gather people's experiences and to try to figure out what would actually make your life just better on a day-to-day -day basis, right? What would really support you in all the different kinds of labor that you have to do? The, the care labor would support you in, um, you know, the, 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 the thriving of your family and, and of your community and try to then think, okay, well, like, how do we shape a neighborhood to to make those things happen, right? And gender equity is, is one lens that can be put on that. It's not the only lens or maybe shouldn't be the only lens that's applied, but it's one that, you know, when we start to really listen to people, we can learn things because, yeah, sometimes it's it's amazing when you, you'll look at designs and you think, oh, did nobody, you know, there's the example, I think it's a library at Cornell where the architect designed all the floors as sort of grates that you could see through and it's like, oh, did you ask like a, a woman 
<laughs> what it's like to go upstairs or walk around a floor that you can see up in and also it's winter there like five months of the year so like people drag it like just these like the things that are not again the fun and sexy parts of being an architect i guess like thinking about where does snow drip down <laughs> and what are the people in my building wearing on a day-to-day -day basis but these are the things that matter to people's lives right and i think victoria's point too about like uh for architects if you're given a task of designing a building it's also you know trying to think about the wider community context and how that place interacts with the other places around it and with the surrounding community so not just the people like if it's a condominium for example who might live there or the people who might work there but everybody else who that building is now kind of part of the fabric of, of their lives even just moving past it or around it but um, are there other ways even for workplaces to draw the public in or to have public services um, incorporated as, as part of those spaces such that it's not these like there's this building over here, I never go there. And that, you know, like it's a more integrated sense of placemaking uh, that really has the potential to maybe bring people together. We're being optimistic again. It's good to be optimistic. I was just going to say very quickly as well on that point, really interestingly, we've, we've just completed a large commercial building at Buckley Graham and a typical city block that was totally unpermeable. And it was very close to a new crossrail station. So the footfall, people moving through and past the building, which has three facades, um, was going to increase. And we, and this was both planning and developer sort of how we, we won the job, was actually about extending a pedestrian route through the city block, which ate in to their lettable space. But as a developer, you know, you don't want to do that because you want and but they bought into it and the reason they did that is because they could see the value both in terms of planning um, which was quite a sensitive area but also in terms of how people would then move and interact with the building so inevitably all of a sudden you're unlocking a whole another side of that building which has a cafe which is open to the public it's obviously a private kind of commercially minded um, entity but that inevitably has positive impact on the wider public space, even though we're not sort of necessarily physically touching that. And so I think there has to be that balance of, of planning of why people develop buildings, but then also that value through design, which is something that a term that's thrown around a lot, but actually needs to kind of drill down into understanding that it's just not about square footage, that it's not just about hitting a budget, but actually there's kind of wider considerations that really should be able to help everybody involved. Um, definitely. Um, and I, I, I think that these um, ways of kind of making um, the building and the kind of walkable space around the city more open are so important. I think at the same time, it, um that uh point that you raised earlier victoria of um so much of the kind of supposedly public space especially in london that is actually private that is still a tension that exists there and something that the designers need to be really sensitive to um because a lot of these places are ultimately still policed um with that kind of um idea of like keeping them safe um, that Leslie you talk about extensively um, that is only safety for a kind of relatively small and and very kind of normative group of people and is actually less safe for um, the most vulnerable um, and 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 their needs are perhaps um, still still become secondary to or remain secondary to um, the the vision of a very kind of like clean public space um we have a lot of really amazing questions and i don't want to start steering the conversation off in too many directions but um i think that uh i yeah i i would love to still keep some of these in um and one of them is um about uh how um 
uh, for how young women, especially, um, but but or many women, um, f can feel more freedom outside the house than inside of it um, because of the uh, by, because of constraints put on them by family, because of a kind of surveillance from um, the from the parents, and um, how and the question is how can we imagine creating more spaces, both public and private, that allow women. Um, that freedom and obviously this is something that has been uh, keenly exacerbated by um, COVID as people have been largely unable to get outside um, of their homes and now with kind of additional lockdowns and additional closings in winter when there's like not when the parks aren't so hospitable anymore um, yeah uh, uh, what what kind of spaces could be could be made outside of outside of the home. Yes, great question. Um, yeah, I think um, young women, especially like girls and and teenagers, are like rarely considered as a kind of constituency for which we might plan for. I think often the interventions in public space that are targeted at you know, youth are often kind of targeted at young men who are sometimes seen as like a potential problem population. So we have to give them something to do in public space. Uh, but we don't really think about young women in the same way. We either think about them as needing to be protected in public space or as not interested or active participants in public space. So I think that is something that just could change again from the from the ground up in terms of thinking about uh, who are our users, right? Or who isn't using the space, right? That's always a really great question. Like who isn't here and why are they not here, right? And, and trying to, to find that out and to find out the things that uh, young women would particularly value in, in public space. But even, yeah, more broadly thinking about, um, you know, there's, it's, this is a question I, I sort of get a lot and it's it's difficult because there, I think there are some design things, but there's also just a, a big social shift that has to happen because women going out into public space, we experience so much kind of unwanted intrusions into our daily lives, everything from the sort of, you know, cheer up love as you're walking down the street, which doesn't seem hostile, but you know what, when it happens to you every day, it's really freaking annoying um, and and you know men never say that to other men so what's going on there right uh, to the more hostile um, or, or potentially escalating into hostile sexual harassment violence unwanted touching in public spaces groping on public transportation like these are things that you know design can only go so far to <laughs> fix this problem right that's a ma major societal shift that has to happen to kind of recognize that like women are full human beings who are entitled to their personal space and who don't owe conversation or care or attention to to anybody else like um just, just as a, by virtue of there being women them being women in public space but in terms of what what sorts of spaces i mean this is again a conundrum because the kinds of spaces that we've sort of assumed are good for women are kind of just like cafes and these sort of again like home like or the third space right the space that's kind of a hybrid of home and and work and i think you know women do enjoy those spaces there's a bit of privatization and safety in there but i i would like especially in the time of covid i think it is a an imperative question to think about how can women, how can families really access public space? Part of that comes back to this question about like embodiment and are we sort of taking care of like people's basic human needs in, in public spaces? Because those are some of the things that I think would draw people out, right? Do you have places to sit? Are there places to play? Can you go to the bathroom? Is there somewhere to get food? Is there water? Like very basic questions that really do a lot to encourage people to use those spaces. I think um, kind of adding adding to that uh, that question of, of or not question but that um, that reality of harassment that women face um, and thinking about some of the solutions that have been um, that have been posed to try and deal with that um, I think uh, such as for example kind of segregating um, train 
carriages, uh, which obviously <laughs> um, creates a whole um, other set of problems in terms of who is then allowed in which train carriages and creating a huge a number of problems for gender non-conforming or uh, trans individuals who then face a, a question of, of which carriage they are able to use and which carriage they will face the least harassment for for using. Um, and I think that it would be yeah really valuable to speculate a little bit on um, on on not just on things that are unhelpful that have been done kind of like maybe with with good intentions but not fully thinking through the ramifications of of uh, of those actions um but also um kind of incorporating a question that has come through um how uh the fear of fear of the other has, translates into spatial boundaries and how um how spaces can try and and feel kind of more inclusive and more for everyone maybe through like uh if 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 not you know solving the problem necessarily because i know that's a really um difficult thing to ask uh but through at least discussing issues where things maybe could have been done better. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one, if, if I'm honest. I, think, I, d I don't know about you guys, but um, I realised as soon as lockdown lifted in the summer you can't really leave your house in London without spending 50 quid it feels like um, and like you say there's so much sort of um, privatization around the sorts of spaces women might like to use and um, it's also things like you know we all know when the public toilets closed and suddenly it's like oh, I can't go to a park how am I going to do and I'm, I'm kind of speaking from somebody who doesn't have anybody who's dependent who's like you know fairly middle class so I, I, but what something that really struck me over the summer was um i live near a park in london and we're very lucky in terms of parks in this city but and there were so many people in the park and it was just a joy to see and it was the most diverse i would say it's ever appeared which is really good because um like you say, Leslie, it's sort of questioning the people that aren't there. Um, and but but how how public space? I mean, you know, without and then you sorry, you look at European countries with much better climates, for example. Generally, they use outdoor space much more successfully than we certainly do here. Um, and I don't think the answer is building sort of structures or covers, you know, all over the place. So, yeah, again, Lily, I, I don't think I have the answer either, but um, it's, some, it's something that, yeah, people need to feel encouraged and enabled to, to do more. But how you do that through the winter months is, is a difficult question. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely a challenge. Obviously, in Canada, it's going to be, we don't all like own snowshoes and cross country skis, um, in case that's the impression that. <laughs> <laughs> that you all have over there um so, but but in terms of yeah encouraging different groups of people to use the spaces that we have i mean i think part of this is um recognizing that the um it's it's sort of again turning something on its head in that we have this assumption that like I don't know white middle class people feel fear of people of color right which is true but people of color also feel a lot of fear in those spaces because they are aware that they're more likely to be policed or to have security called on them or to be harassed or to be just be looked at in a nasty way or to have comments thrown at them right so when we think about like who do we need to create safety for to me that comes back to that question of again sort of margin to center like if we thought about what would make this space the most safe for a trans person for a, a, a homeless person for a low-income person a disabled person a person of color a recent immigrant um you know a, a 
young mom with kids, like what would make the space the most safe and comfortable for them? It's kind of like a trickle up safety, right? Because again, the people who have the most privilege are um, in, in many ways always the most safe, right? They're the least likely to experience violence, especially in public spaces. Private, in the home, that's a different question and that's a, another area of intervention. But in public spaces, it's, uh, you know, all the groups that we've been told to fear are the groups most likely to experience violence. So we kind of have to switch that on its head as well and, and recognize what are the things that we are doing as a society to create more unsafety for, for these groups of people. And that could include, again, very basic things like making them, making, having no publicly available restrooms so people have to go into a private business to try to use the restroom, which then becomes a danger, can become a dangerous situation if you're seen as an unwanted, um, you know, interloper in that space. So uh, some of these things are kind of, can be kind of low hanging fruit. It's not that it's going to solve the entire problem, but there, there are little things that can be done, I think. I think as well, just quickly, Leslie, is like that what you, you mentioned earlier about designing for niches is all, all it always is like, oh yeah, we need to think about, you know, whether it's somebody who's visually impaired or, or whether it's the weight of a door or whatever. And then they're all like the difficult, unglamorous bit, certainly, of architecture, like you say. But actually, surely, if you're designing for that, like, a, 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 you know, that bottom up approach, it's got to be a good thing for everybody. So they need to be seen less as the minority or the difficult thing to overcome and actually sort of, yeah, better in the round, I suppose. And um, with, with that kind of idea of optimism in mind, are there, are there kind of any examples um, that kind of either of you have seen uh, since the pandemic, but also before the pandemic um, of urban initiatives that feel super inclusive um that feel like they are doing something really valuable even if they're even if they're very small um just any kind of anything you've noticed or or um again if uh i, I again i think a critical uh, view is 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 valuable here <laughs> i'm trying to stay on the optimistic side of things but um but uh for example looking at um the that uh uh, where kind of um, street dwellers have been cleared away to serve these kind of private restaurants, trying to trying to um, keep economies going. Kind of the ways in which some of these things that uh, show uh, seem to be signs of kind of um, coping with the pandemic are actually not quite up to scratch. Um, yeah, your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think in some cities have, um, yeah, used the kind of moment of the pandemic to do some things that were politically unpopular, like in North American cities, um, many are quite like hostile to cycling or to pedestrianized spaces. It's still very like car centered. Uh, but the pandemic was sort of a moment where a lot of cities were like, oh, we could actually just close down some space to cars, we could pedestrianize. And then that allows like a wider variety of uses. It doesn't, you know, if businesses want to expand into the sidewalk, it doesn't destroy pedestrian space. It doesn't destroy accessibility for people using mobility devices because you've actually created a lot of public space. And so, and, and increasing like cycling lanes so that people have alternate modes of transportation to work. Um, there's also, you know, policy kind of interventions like rent freezes or eviction freezes, um, making public transportation free for a period of time. Like these are things that, you know, you can't even like talk about in sort of normal times, but in a, in a crisis, it's like, oh yeah, these are actually things that, that can make people's lives better. So I think it at least opens the door to, um, you know, can we, what ways could we encourage some of this uh, to continue, at least in some form, or to increase protections for, you know, people who are precariously housed and so on. And uh, again, thinking about homeless people, like, I think most cities, I mean, they, they said that they were going to take care of the problem, but it hasn't worked out that well. But it is still a moment where it's like, the, the little things that have been done, like putting people into vacant 
buildings or hotels that are vacant. It's like, this can be done. Like it is possible, right? Things that we were sort of like, oh, that's, that's too big a problem. We can't possibly tackle that. Like you, maybe you can. So that's sort of the optimistic thing that maybe some of these little interventions that we've done in the pandemic will allow us to say, oh yeah, like long-term, we could actually make a dent in some of these problems. Um, thank you for all those reminders of nice things, of, of like actual progressive things that have um, happened. Um, and, and, and this, this reminder of, of um, that kind of, those, all those kind of hopeful um, feelings that came with every every like actual what was what was kind of been posed as a temporary solution, but is actually kind of serving as proof that these things can absolutely be addressed in a much more real way than they have been so far. Um, and we have um, a few minutes left, and since we are on quite an optimistic um uh no i i just wondered if um you both had some thoughts of kind of what we can be uh taking away from this discussion what um what can we be um like with what we've understood of um the problems that we're facing and the ways in which things have been um not done well enough or should be better considered um what uh what can we take away with us and what can we um work on to do better and how might we, we be going about that i think leslie will say much more profound things probably than me but i i, I kind of i think the overarching takeaway for me um and it kind of, because of what we're talking about is obviously in the context of what's been happening in the world. Um, but I think the, the, the best part of it for me has been the fact that we've all been made to kind of stop and shift and reflect and kind of get off that rat race that we were all kind of churning along on our eyes, certainly was. Um, and um, I, I, yeah, as I suppose the, the conversation in some way it has been fairly optimistic and I, I think that's a good thing and I think both from sort of design but the wider conversation in terms of um, fe feminism in public space and design, you know, there are opportunities to change things and although some of those I think space might be quite small or um, relatively isolated to your day to day, you know, they can have wider impacts um, on society. And sometimes I think there's kind of stumbling blocks of how governments, etc., are dealing with COVID um, is meaning that we can't just return instantly back to what it was before. And we've got to see that as hopefully a kind of shift to change and address um, specifically things as those that have become more exposed during these times. Yes, thank you for that. I, I think the, <clears throat> a, a question that kind of remains, yeah, this question of will we go back to normal for me and thinking about um, having all of these questions around care labor really come to the forefront during the pandemic, a question is kind of like, what, you know, we're kind of in, still in kind of crisis mode. So there isn't really a lot of choice around whether women or, or families are gonna be looking after their children or looking after sick people. But when the, when, if hopefully pandemic ends, you know, will we refuse to do that? Like, will we sort of say, no, no, never again. Like never again, are we gonna be put in that position or to have so much of the, this burden of care placed on, on us on such an individual family based level and uh, because I and I, I think it's, it's also a broader societal reckoning because we're um, you know the some of the news from from the US for example of something like hundreds of thousands of women leaving the labor force right because they either have lost their jobs or they there's no way to juggle the multiple responsibilities that they're now facing that has an economic impact that's not nothing i think there's still somehow in the air an assumption that like women's 
even women's paid work is not the foundation of the economy, when in many ways it is, right? All of these things that we're trying to reopen to save the economy, a lot of these are, are things that women are predominantly the workers in, like the service industry. And so I wonder if there is going to be finally like a realization that both the care work that people do is the thing that lets the economy function and also that women are not like secondary or disposable to even the capitalist economy, this thing that we so desperately want to save. So from a kind of a, you know, again, a design and urban point of view, can we think about how are we going to make our transportation networks function in ways that allow people to do more than just go to and from work and a nine to five job, right? How are we going to reshape that? How are we going to create different models of home and family such that people are not kind of shuffled into living in one particular way, even though it might be unsafe or exploitative or unsustainable. So those are just a, a couple of things that I think the sort of the design, the urban community can be thinking about in terms of uh, approaching these, these larger societal questions. Um, thank you so much, both of you. Um, I think it's some really, really valuable um things to take away there and i th i think that um i i hope that we can treat this as a kind of paradigm shift as and to um as you kind of um as you kind of said before um yeah really using this as a way to um question the things that we have taken for granted um so far which uh we should kind of continue to do and try to do in a resilient fashion both in terms of um pushing um uh, authorities and and governments and councils to um to provide solutions for a more inclusive city but also in terms of the small collective actions that can um hopefully make our world a more livable one um i think we should um end it there um thank you um both so much uh leslie for your talk and victoria for your um responses um i think this has been a really valuable um and uh nice conversation um and thank you um very much to all of the w uh, program partner practices uh for um all of your uh, support um, with this program um, so we can continue to have conversations like this one. Um, the, um, the video for this will be online uh, tomorrow and we're going to send out a um, link to um, all of the attendees and um, on a final note the uh, W Awards are um, open for entry at the moment. The Architectural Review um, W Awards uh, celebrate um, design by women from all over the world. Um, they're free to enter and the deadline is on the 27th of November so it's quite soon and you can um, nominate uh, someone else or you can put yourself forward um, and it's uh, just a way to try and um, celebrate uh, some of the people who are maybe um, <laughs> underrepresented uh, in architectural media uh, and in media generally elsewhere. Um, and uh, thank you so much to everyone for attending. I think I've covered all my housekeeping um, and, <laughs> um, and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.